Um, so my name is Karen Havis. Uh, I work in the MPH program here. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist with some training in economics. Um, and today I want to talk to you about One Health. So out in the world, when people talk about One Health, they talk about zoonotic disease. It almost goes hand in hand. And you skip like the other 90% of the One Health discussions, particularly when you talk about livestock. Okay, so we're gonna. We're going to talk about, we're going to start with some definitions. What is One Health? What is One Health? So One Health, we have two definitions, the American Veterinary Medical Association one and the World Veterinary Association one. And they all include things such as multiple disciplines, so it's not just veterinarians, it's not just physicians, it's not just um, uh, environmental scientists, it's multiple dis disciplines coming together to work on local, national, and global problems to obtain optimal health, okay? For not just people, but animals and the environment. They both say there's an interconnection of animals, people, the environment for health. And this is why I think we often focus on zoonotics, because that's a really easy connect, right? You can get salmonella in the environment, sometimes it's shed from cows, people get sick. I can draw a line between all those things really easily. So we kind of get stuck in the zoonotic des uh, description of One Health. But that doesn't really allow for that multiple discipline, does it? it? It constrains it when you think of it that way. So I'm going to tie One Health to livelihood. Okay, I'm going to talk about how One Health and livestock health relate to how just people live. And livelihood is different from employment. It's different from income. Livelihood is about your capabilities, assets, and activities you use to meet your physical needs and respond to shocks. So physical needs, that shelter, water, food, social, social interactions, right? We all need these physical things. And we rely on a number of sources of capital. So human capital, labor, right? People able to work, that's, that's capital, human capital. Intellect is human capital. Natural capital, that's the rivers, the waters, the streams, the fresh air, everything you can get from your environment. Financial capital, that's your banking account, that's your credit systems, right? That's your exchange rates, that's your ability to trade. Social capital is your social value you find in your community, your friends, your family, marriages, etc. Social groups. And then, of course, physical capital is infrastructure, okay? So we're talking about regulatory buildings, laboratories, roads, uh, water sanitation, um, feed mills, the ability to ship feed, all those things. And employment is just one aspect of livelihood. And we think of employment because we think of income. So that's not necessarily how everybody thinks of livelihood in the world. We tend to think of it that way more in the United States. So let's talk about the rest of the world. The world poverty breakdown is, is pretty sobering. There's about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, and about 27% of them are poor. Incredibly poor, okay? So 2.1 billion people live in poverty. About another 1.7 billion people are on the edge of poverty, right? They're just, they're, they're really at risk of becoming impoverished. And about 0.8 billion or 780 million live on less than $2 a day. There are about 330 million people in the, in the United States. So twice the population in the United States is living in extreme poverty. So when you break down the graph, you've got about 5.6 billion people living okay, but 1.7 of them are in the brink of poverty. And then the other third lives in extreme poverty. And of those in, in, in extreme poverty and in, in, in poverty, 70% of the poor are rural poor. So that means they live among livestock in the agricultural settings. And 75% of these rural poor are smallholders. So smallholders are typically mixed agricultural producers. They have a couple sheep, they have a couple goats, they might have a cow, maybe they have poultry, some parts of the world they have pigs, but they don't have an industrial farm, right? They have just a small number of animals to, to provide for their needs. Now, income is not as important who are world poor as assets. And their assets are in their animals. That's how they survive, is what they have available to them to sell, to trade, to barter, to feed themselves. Not so much their bank account. 
Primarily because there's not a bank. There's not a lot of money. Okay. There's a couple great papers out there, and I have a number of uh, references at the end of this lecture, so if you're really interested in this, there's a lot of things to read. But this is a great diagram of how livestock contribute as an asset to livelihood. Okay, so let's take a look. They improve soil fertility through manure. A lot of uh, small farmers and small holders use their livestock manure to improve their soil fertility. They also use their livestock to plow their fields and to pull their products to market. Um, they use it as a social status to get married. You often need a dowry. That includes cattle. There's a reason why there's cattle raiding in the world and people get killed <coughs> regularly due to cattle raiding, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, Sudan, Uganda, that region of the world. Nigeria, it's a common cause of conflict in these areas. A lot of pastoralists now carry AK-47s for a reason, because these are assets. And the more cattle you have, the more animals you have, the, more, the, the higher your social, your social standing. So the larger your social standing, the better off you are in society in a lot of ways. You have more access to more things, you have more of a say, you have more power, etc. <coughs> Better nutrition and health. This is where they get the majority of their animal source foods, and we're going to talk about the benefit of animal source foods in terms of productivity. Uh, it does provide income. They can go to the market and sell these things. They can, they can sell them to their neighbor. They can sell it to a distributor. They can sell it to um, a local slaughterhouse, to the local butcher. That is money in their hand. It, income does, does exist. It's just not as valuable as their assets. So, Livestock contributes in many ways. And just on this slide, we've seen the, the increased productivity. We've seen how it impacts the natural environment. We can see how it impacts um, social standing. And we can see how it impacts our food security. So let's talk about it. Yep, all of those. Let's talk about it here, too. And I'll bring that back up just so you have it. Here's an, a more recent publication done by um, a group of people out of uh, Ilri was heavily involved in Kenya. And this is how animals relate to human health directly, and not just through the fact that we get zoonotic disease from them, right? And on occasion, we give it back. So it, you know, it's got two sides to that coin. We don't ever talk about it. You know, in animals, there's labor that they can do. Oh, there you go. Probability of zoonotic disease. They can contaminate the water. They can provide production for animal source foods. They can define land allocation for increased food crop production. They help with nutrient cycling through, um, through manure for increased crop production. They can provide food for sale. They can provide all these things. All of these lines coming off are what animals provide, and they come back to animal source food production, human health status, human nutritional status. It's all linked, and it's linked in a very complex web. So as a veterinarian, can I address the food crop production? No, I, I, not really, right? The, but I can address part of it. I can say, OK, well, you're going to use animals for um, tr traction, nutrient cycling. I can try to make sure you have a healthy animal so that they can pull a, a, a plow. And I can talk to you about the zoonotic diseases that might be spread in that manure, right? Or how to increase your, your output so that you have better manure available. Okay. Animals do a lot. These are all pictures from, except for this one. This one's not mine. This one I got off of Amazon. You can buy cow patties off of Amazon for, um, for either use in your garden or use in, I guess there's some kind of uh, ritual or ceremony where you can use them, but the rest of them are. This is a woman in northern Ethiopia. Those are her, those are her goats. She was concerned because they had a respiratory disease, and that was her asset. That was her whole value. Those, those animals were how she figured out her life. So she came to McKellie University, the veterinary school there, and <clears throat> went to see the doctors. Uh, this is from Uganda, some chicken farmers in the West Nile region. It was a woman who was progressive. She invested in her farm, and she was out-competing all of her other neighbors and her chicken farming. Okay. Uh, this is also in Ethiopia. They use a lot of cattle, or um, excuse me, horses for, to draw carts, to move, to move food around. They use a lot of oxen to plow their fields. Um, 
This is one of the most beautiful Ancoli Zebu bulls you will ever see. He is just stunning. He, he provided a lot of status. Their breeding there provided a lot of status for their local breeds. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but this is a local market. And you don't see a lot of cows, but you see a lot of small ruminants. And that's because small ruminants are your bank account. Cows give you social standing, typically. Cattle, not cows. Don't want to leave the guys out. Right? They give you the social standing. But the, the small ruminants, you can buy and sell and trade for food, to, to pay your bills, to pay for education, etc. They're the ones that are more, they're more, more of your liquid asset, if you will. Okay? They're the ones that you tend to see in the markets. People move their animals around. There's a reason for that. People aren't going to buy gas and a truck and move them across the country unless there's an income source from that or a reason for that or a benefit from breeding. This is in the uh, Republic of Georgia, secondary products. They were starting a whole industry. This is one of the first cheesemakers in um, that particular region of Georgia, which is southern Georgia. And this was the first large production site. And they were very proud of it. And they were using this to sell to the city centers. So Batumi and Tbilisi and all those places. And that was me like 10 years ago. I still have that jacket. <laughs> um, and then these are butchers. Right? So they just came from the slaughterhouse to buy the meat. So now they're making, they're, now you have groups of people making money. You have the farmer who sold the, the animal to the slaughterhouse or to the butcher. The butcher who's going to sell that, that product to a consumer. So it's not even just about the farmer. It's about this whole economic system that can be anywhere from direct animal, like raising direct animals, providing care, um, making secondary products, or even generating secondary products, right? So the butchers of the world, the, the cheese makers of the world, that's happening everywhere. Or the people who sell the dump. Amazon, who knew, right? Just, just found that out. So livestock contribute, to break it down very simply, I'll put it into three big buckets, livestock contribute to both food security, economic security, and social security. Not social security like we think of in America, that's a bank account, that you pay into throughout your career, but social security and social capital. The ability to have social standing and power, to pay off dowries, to, um, to receive dowries, all of those things. The food security is very clear. We, it's very clear. Animal source foods. We need those in the first thousand days of life, it's particularly in developing countries where things aren't fortified, right? We benefit in the United States because we get a lot of fortified foods. You, I, my parents told me growing up, drink your milk. There's a reason for that. We've simplified it into drink your milk, right, for, for kids. But it's actually more complex. It has to do with micronutrients and stunting and, and cognitive development. We'll talk a little bit about that. So micronutrient nutrition with animal source foods, especially in young people, very young people, first thousand days, critical to the productivity of the nation. Not the person. I mean, it's important to them, too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> But it impacts at national levels when there is not enough animal source foods to feed the young people of the country. Let alone the, the lack of protein, right? Macronutrient nutrition, you see that. That's a visible. That's not a hidden hunger, typically. If you don't have carbohydrates you, and you don't have protein, you have a swollen belly and you're really skinny. But you might be well fed and still have hidden hunger with this micronutrient deficiency. So animal source foods helps with both of those. It's one of the most nutrient dense foods we have. And there is a very good argument to say, but by nutrient volume, it is not as, um, it has a lesser impact on greenhouse gases than a lot of our crop based foods. But we tend to look at it by total volume, like just produce volume and not nutrient density. So it depends how you look at these things. And that's why there's a huge discussion going on because what is the better way? And that's to be determined. <clears throat> Animal traction, <laughs> like I said a minute ago, you go, to, you go to northern Ethiopia, you get off the plane, and you'll see people plowing their fields with oxen. You'll see them threshing their grain with cattle. That's how they produce their, their grain foods, and that's how they grow their grain foods. The manure for the gardens is actually really important for nutrient recycling, all from livestock. Economic security, the living bank account, the income from sales, the transportation to the markets that they provide. And they're also a bit of an insurance policy, right? If something goes wrong, 
Yeah, I don't have a typically don't have an insurance policy, but I can sell my I can sell my sheep and I can address this. Right? This is a huge economic sector. And it's completely missed because we often think of smallholders as individual households just trying to get by. Right? That's the image you get when you're like, oh, developing countries, farmers. You're not thinking about their web of interconnectedness. Everybody always thinks about, oh, this farmer is trying to feed his family or her family. And that's true. But together, they make up a huge sector of the economy, a huge sector of this economy. It's just informal. It's just not measured. It's completely left out of the gross domestic product, which is the, the amount, the value of all the things a country produces in a year. Or it's at least poorly estimated. So you start talking about livestock, they make up about 40% of the agricultural GDP in a lot of countries. They have more value per volume than crops. Massively amounts more. There's a reason why you can, if you put bread and milk side by side, volume per volume, you're spending more on milk. They have more value inherently. So they tend to grow faster in that, in that economy in livestock production, when you invest in it, it tends to grow faster than crop production, just solely because of the, that value add when it becomes efficient. It, you sell all sorts of things, right? You can sell hides. Hides are a massive industry. If you've traveled and you've been overseas, and you've been to different places, you'll see hides being sold. They're often bundled and wrapped in huge Buckets, you'll see them in the marketplaces. You, they'll try to sell them to you at any place you go, along with the spear that's trying to convince you you can take onto a plane, right? <laughs> no, 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 you can carry it on. And you're like, I cannot, no, I cannot carry that on. That is a pointy, tall thing. <laughs> that's not going to fly. Nor can you take the hides home, okay? Just FYI, please don't, <laughs> don't take the hides home. Um, but they're a, huge part of the, they're a huge part of the market. Animals themselves and all the products, eggs and meat and milk, etc. It's the fastest growing sector in developing economies, the livestock sector, the livestock sector of ag. And it's because when it becomes efficient and you can do it well, you get the most bang for your buck. And even in developed economies like the United States, in terms of our agricultural sector, on average, this isn't the United States, this is all developed economies still over 53% of our agricultural economy is accounted for through livestock and livestock related things. Slaughterhouses, um, the distribution centers, the markets, the actual farming, etc. The processing of these animal products, that cheese maker, that butcher, the hide preparer, that's one of the biggest growing sectors. And that's a good sign because when economies start to diversify, they're more resilient. Is that everybody owns a cow and tries to sell the milk, how much is your milk going to cost? Who's going to buy milk if everybody owns a cow? No one. No one's going to buy milk. Be like, I got milk at home. I'm good. But if you start to diversify, we're like, well, I don't have milk at home anymore, but I buy milk from you and I make the cheese and I'll keep some to drink. Perfect. That's what you want. So let's talk about food security. Everybody talks about the first three, right? There's differences here. These first three, food availability, accessibility, and safety. We talk about this guy, food safety, all the time. That's what we do. This is our area of expertise. Veterinarians are experts in food safety. We're some of the best in the world at it, and there's a reason for that. But you have to include number four. Food has to be culturally appropriate. So when I travel, I have to sometimes put my cultural biases aside when they give me a meal. And I'm like, oh, OK, I'm going to eat this now. <laughs> you know, it's going to be good. Whereas it's a delicacy where I'm at, right? It's, a, it's an honor that they're giving it to me. But my cultural bias of being an American, I'm like, oh, God, all right, we're going to eat all the organ meat. <laughs> Bring on the liver and the kidneys and the tripe. And the, right? It's not what I normally eat, though, but it's really valuable food. So is that culturally appropriate food for me? No. But it's the same as me going there and being like, oh, here, here's corn. Take our corn. Oh, here's, here's a hamburger. Take our hamburger. It's just not appropriate for them. It's not what they normally eat. So let's talk about each of these components. Food security, number one, food availability. Food availability is the food actually being there, like existing in this space. So currently, there may not be anymore, but there was food over here a few minutes ago. <laughs> but until you were given permission, you could not access it. 
right? I mean, in theory. You might have run them over and taken it anyway, but that's, that's a whole other conversation. But food availability is literally just being there. You need money to buy it, you need permission to access it, you need all sorts of things. But smallholders provide 80% of the food produced in a lot of developing parts of the world. 80% of the food in their communities, smallholders. Not Smithfield, not JBS, not 5,000 cow dairies. A guy and a girl who own three to five animals, small ruminants, cattle, etc. And collectively, they make a huge amount of food. Many low-income countries rely on these informal markets, and here's a few examples of informal markets. This one is in uh, Talavi, um, a part of Georgia, and this one is in Hidapuscaro, another part of Georgia. Um, Georgia is in the Caucasus region. They're, they're middle-income country at this point, but these are still informal markets, right? No one's regulating this. Uh, no, I shouldn't say that. They're regulated, right? Not every market is, is completely well regulated. The farmer's market, downtown Ithaca, is that regulated? I mean, yeah, but is someone be coming in every farmer's market day and checking? I kind of, I, I would doubt it, right? I would seriously doubt it. All these smallholders who have small farms in, in, in New York who sell beef or pigs or whatever right off the farm, yeah, they're regulated, but they're not regulated like commercial farming is regulated. It's a different game. So. These informal markets are great, though, because, because they go through less regulation, things are less expensive. So they make more foods available to people because the costs are lower. So they don't have to charge as much, which is good because, you know, that whole less than $2 a day thing, right? So it makes more food available to these, these countries. They account for more than 80% of milk sales in developing countries. This is a huge amount of food being made. And it's estimated that these goods, these informal market goods, all of them, animal and plant, account for almost 40% of the GDP of a country. So 40% of everything made in that country is in these informal systems. They're not touched by taxes. They're not touched. That money is just changing hands as it is. It's a huge loss of income to the country, I'll be honest. But it's really good for the, the world's poor because it keeps the cost down. They don't pay taxes. They just exchange their, whatever their price that the, the whole supply and demand system just allows it to be. It's not, it's not manipulated at all. It's kind of interesting, actually. Accessibility is a whole other thing. This is being able to buy the food. So this is some of the things I just talked about. These informal markets are cheaper for people in general, so more people can afford food. If I have $2 and I go to, I go to a supermarket in... Um, um, Kampala, like a, a regulated supermarket, maybe for expats, right? That $2 may buy me a banana. It buy me a lot of bananas. A mango. I might be able to buy a mango. I go out into the community. I go a couple hours from there. I can buy 10 mangoes for $2. Why? They didn't have to ship it. They don't pay taxes. They don't have to pay for rent. They have to pay for all these things. And their, their population is different, and their willingness to pay is different. So these markets provide a lot of food security through accessibility. The food's there, and now they can afford to purchase it. Entry is really easy. I just show up. Maybe I set up a table. You've been to places where people set up a roadside table, and they put a spike out with like the head of the thing that's on their table. Pig, sheep, goat. You're like, oh, we can buy lamb there. OK. That's it. That's their cost. That's it. That's all. I mean, you know, food safety is an issue at that moment, but that's it. It's all it costs. And the market forces that drive these prices down are because there are multiple vendors doing this. So the competition actually makes the prices lower. It's not so great for the vendor. They don't make as much money. But it's great for the consumer. So it helps with accessibility. This last one is really important. Domestic production of food, we always talk trade. You go to a country and you start talking about their national animal health system. You sit down with their... Ministry of Livestock or Ministry of Agriculture, and the first thing you're going to say is, we want to trade. We want a regional reference lab. We want these things. And then you go out into the community, and you talk to the regional bureaus, and you start to, talk to, you start to get into real conversations. What they want is food security. Of course, they, everyone wants food security. Every country wants food security for the people. Well, the food security is in the domestic production. It's not in the importation. Because the day their currency tanks, <coughs> 
right? Or our currency tanks, or somebody's currency goes awry, the price changes. The price changes because whenever you go to a place and you <clears throat> use money, you don't use dollars typically, right? You exchange it. You stop at the Barclays ATM and you pull out local money. Well, that money you get, the amount you get for your dollar depends upon exchange rates. So if all of a sudden the dollar strengthens or it's worth more than the dollar or the, the currency of the place you're at, they now have to pay more for food. So if I send in, if I send in milk, like evaporated milk, and it's a dollar for a, a package of it, and a dollar at the time might be five units of local currency, well, as soon as their currency gets devalued, now it's 10 units of local currency, 15 units of local currency. They're still making their, their same salary. It did not change. But now they have to spend more of it to get milk when the exchange rate changes. So domestic production of food is also a national food security issue and food accessibility issue. <clears throat> food safety, oh man, food safety in the world's bad. <laughs> um, really pretty, we've done well. I mean, we've made a lot of strides, but we have 70 million, you know, foodborne illnesses in the United States alone every year. So now you export that to where they put their table out and a uh, pike with a livestock head on it and the meat on the table with no refrigeration or a meat hanging with no refrigeration in a little, in a little storefront. Right? It changes the dynamics of safety. Okay. Immensely, and we see it. We see it in the, in the recent um, in the recent estimates of the global food the global foodborne illness estimates done by WHO. This is what they've come up with. In Africa, forty to sixty percent of all campy salmonella, brucella, and shiga toxins are due to foodborne illness. That's a lot. They have the highest burden of disability adjusted life years associated with foodborne illness. So those are the years of productive life lost, disability adjusted life years, either due to <coughs> premature death or just disability, where you just can't be as productive. They have 1,200 per 100,000. That far exceeds any other region of the world. <clears throat> far exceeds. It's twice the burden for bacterial diseases for any other region of the world, and it's 70% of the global foodborne diseases. Africa accounts for 70% of our global foodborne diseases. And it's not followed too far behind by the Middle East and Asia. And these regions, they're not all developing, but they, they encompass a lot of our developing world. It leaves out chunks of the developing world, I get it. But what we can see from this is that food safety is a massive issue in these places. So currently, do we have food security? No. Are the markets going to help with that, the informal markets? This is where the downside of regulation, the lack of regulation shows up, is in, food security, is in the food safety side. And then, of course, culturally appropriate foods. And that can be the type of food prepared, but it can also be how it's prepared. There's reasons why we have halal and kosher and conventional slaughter. There are three different types of ways of slaughtering animals because that's culturally appropriate. Not because it's efficient, not because the market demands it. It's only demanded because people require it culturally, right? Okay. But yeah, women in agriculture, a whole other subset. Agriculture for women in developing countries is their asset. That's the asset they're allowed to have. They can't own land. They may not or may be able to get employed. Education opportunities may or may not exist, but they can have chickens. They can have pigs if it's culturally appropriate. They can have small ruminants. And they do a lot for the security of their households when they do that. They're the ones who are most commonly street vendors and market vendors, so that's their income. And when they control that income, when it's an income that's allowable for the woman of the household to control, they make decisions on behalf of the household. So it's been tied to improve the education of the children in the households because they'll pay for the school fees and to improve nutrition as well. This is why there's a huge movement to bring women into ag. Because what they've seen through many studies over a lot of time now is that when women have money in their hands, they do things that better the household more often than when just men have the money in their hands. And it's a culturally appropriate asset for them to manage. Okay. This is one of my favorite topics. 
people don't realize how important stunting is. So the, the um, sustainable development goals for the, the, for the UN are a group of goals that we want to hit by 2030. And a lot of them have to do with poverty reduction and sustainability and things like that. But one of them is about stunting. And there's a couple different types of nutritional issues. There's stunting, which means you are um, shorter and underweight than you should be, uh, more than you should be. There's wasting, which is just the level of that above. And then there's obesity, right? There's actual metrics for this. I'm not going to go into the two standard deviations above and below. But stunting severe, a severe form of malnutrition. Obesity, or overweight, is another form of malnutrition on the other side of the scale. And uh, wasting is, is basically underweight, if you will. But stunting causes long-term health effects. It diminishes your cognitive potential which means that some people never reach their cognitive potential. They literally hit six years old, and because of the food they ate, they will never have the, the cognitive abilities they could have had. So when you have a large population of children that grow up with, no, with an inadequate diet, often due to micronutrients, a lack of micronutrients, the majority of which you find in animal-sourced foods animal source foods. We do not want to push veganism and vegetarianism on the developing world because these animal source foods are, are keeping them from stunting, both physical but cognitive. And if they grow up, a whole cohort of them grow up without completely developed minds, what is that going to do to your nation's productivity? We push people to go to college and get educated and go out into the workforce and be creative and innovative. But what if I took away your ability to do that before you even started? And that's essentially what we're doing. So micronutrients are incredibly important. And the bioavailability of these in animal source foods far exceeds any other food source. So when I meet people and I tell, they ask me what I do, and I tell them, you know, I, I try to go out and make livestock healthier. And, and they go, oh, good, is that for the livestock? And I'm like, no, that is not for the livestock. That's for the children. Right? We do this for the families and the children of the countries because they need these foods. And the first thousand days of life is the most critical time in life for them to do this. The World Bank estimates, and this is stunning. This is stunning. The World Bank estimates that stunting is responsible for a 10% decline in productivity for these countries. That's on average, right? So there's a, uh, there's a scale there. So there's some that are going to be much more and some that are much less. 10% of our productivity. Could you imagine? Just because you didn't have access to foods that allowed you to grow both mentally and physically. So let's look a little deeper. Ag was once thought to be the lowest rung of society. And what we've learned in terms of development, in terms of sector development, is like, oh, you start here, and then you move to manufacturing, and then you come service industry. And that's a, that's a developed economy. But the reality is, agriculture is actually the framework. It provides all the food, it provides a healthy, productive workforce, and then it provides the places where we need an innovation. Why was the cotton gin one of the first amazing creations we had? Because it solved an ag problem. It made us so much more efficient and effective. And it allowed us to develop other sectors. So it's not like this is the bottom rung of a ladder ag. It's actually the, the foundational of the pyramid. Unless you have that, and unless you have the food sources you need, and you identify the problems you need for manufacturing and innovation technology to come in and address, there is no development. That doesn't just magically move to manufacturing computers and cars. You need a reason to have them. And it all stems from that foundational sector, which is agriculture. I like this graph. I don't know if you know about Gapminder, but Gapminder is this great online resource. And this graph is basically, this is your GDP, agricultural percentage of GDP, and agricultural workers, percent of workers that are agricultural in your economies. The United States is probably somewhere down here. Uh, Ethiopia is probably somewhere up here. <coughs> Why? So what am I saying? I'm saying that when you have a higher percentage of agricultural workers and a higher percentage of agriculture as part of your GDP, you're less developed. Huh. 
Typically, when you say higher and higher, that's, that means more, right? You're more developed. But this is what happens. The United States makes a ton of food. We make, well, our, the efficiency in our agriculture is stunning. We make so much food that we make, um, of all the corn we make, we consume 80% of it. And then we also supply 80% of the world's corn on top of that. That's our efficiency. Yet, it's not a huge part of our, our, our overall GDP, and it's a small part of our workforce. And the reason is, is because we've made it really efficient. And efficiency allows us to make a lot. And making a lot and using technology to do so, it, gives, it frees us up to let people go do other things. When you have a large part of your workforce required to make the food for your entire population, that's an inefficient system. That's inefficient. If everybody has to do the same thing in order to feed the, the whole country, that's not efficient. And that's what you see in graphs like this. We make a lot of other stuff now. So yeah, the percentage of GDP for agriculture is low because we make a ton of other stuff, but we only do that because we're really efficient at making food. So increased productivity in the ag sector is incredibly important. And what they found over the last, when they've done some historical studies, and to be honest, I think we need a few new ones, <coughs> is that when you invest in the ag sector, you get the greatest return on your investment. Not when you invest in the manufacturing sector, not when you invest in the service sector, but in development, when you invest in the ag sector, you get the, the largest returns for your investment. 81% of poverty reductions associated with the rural sector from all projects from 93 to 2002. Or a lot of projects from 93 to 2002. I shouldn't say all, that's pretty encompassing. From 81 to 2003, when people invested 1%, when you saw 1% change in a GDP associated with agriculture, it actually gave the poor that were part of that rural sector a, great, a greater purchasing power. Their income increased by four, almost 4%. So 1% increase in the, just the national production allowed for a 4% increase in somebody's salary or income. That's, that's growth when you don't have a one-to-one. -one. That's growth, that's efficiency, that is your greatest return on investment. It depends though. If you're focusing on export-oriented export development, that trade where you get affected by exchange rates, it's not the same. If you're talking about your domestic production where you're feeding people there and building that system, you get a lot of, you get a lot of return for your investment. So let's talk about why. We're gonna talk about this this is an economic term. It's called total factor productivity. And the, the reality is this, is, this is the bottom line. So producers can have increased e incomes even if food costs fall. Because as you become more efficient, food costs fall. In the US, we spend minimal amounts, minimal percentages of our income on food compared to other places in the world, where they spend 50 to 70%. Can you imagine spending 50 to 70% of your income on food? Oh my gosh, I could afford nothing else, right? In the US, we spend less than 10%. And it's because food's cheap here. And it's cheap because we make a lot of it efficiently. So you can be productive and still make money despite food prices falling. And it has to do with how well you make your food. And that's total factor productivity. So if I put $100 into my cow, and then I sell the output for my cow, the milk, and I get $100 back, my total factor of productivity is one. It's a multiplier. I basically, I've, I've made no money. It's completely inefficient. I'm not gonna get anywhere. At least I'm not losing money. Like it's not 0.9, right? But I'm not gaining money. Whereas if I put $100 in my cow and I ended up getting $120 out of the products that I got from that cow, now my total factor of productivity has gone up. So the goal is that your inputs are less than your outputs the value of your inputs end up being less than the value for your outputs. And that is what you need to increase faster than prices drop. And there's ways to do that. And the, oh, one important note, and I put this map up uh, purposely, this map is the FAO map for hunger. So the red is the really bad, the orange is the still bad, the lighter pink is not very good. The lightest pink is getting better, and less than 5% are, well, there's still people who are suffering, so let's not forget them, but it's less than 5%. So the places with the greatest need for the more robust food supply are the least food insecure, are the 
are the food insecure regions of the world. So these are the places that need greater productivity and greater efficiency, okay? And these are the places of the world who are losing massive amounts of dollars due to disease in their livestock. And there's a couple different types of disease. There's um, endoparasites, so ones that private veterinarians can treat and make money on. We call them private good diseases. And then ones that like PPR that just kill everything. And that if a private vet tried to treat PPR, they'd just lose money and probably clients because they'd be like, oh, it died. <laughs> Could have predicted that. <laughs> Gave me money anyway, right? So that requires your public good. That requires your governmental framework to help people. They lose huge amounts of money from these diseases. Huge. Does this help your total factor productivity when your animals die? No. Plummets it. So the health of animals is really important for that. Ooh. Okay, so health of animals is really important for that. And this is our last slide. All of this is One Health. You play a role as veterinary students in a lot of this, but not all of it. And that's the fun. That's the fun to reach out to your social scientists or the economists or the environmental guy, or maybe even just taking a pathologist, an epidemiologist, and a research guy or girl along on these trips to help people who have already doing great things. Because animal health is a critical part of productivity but it's not the only part, right? And agriculture is the bedrock for a number of types of securities. It's its own sector of the economy. And it's a huge sector. But unless we're able to make it safer and more productive, it will remain a trap for a lot of people. So these are all the areas, and this is not comprehensive by any means, that One Health encompasses not just the zoonotics. It includes pharmaceuticals, genetics, access to water, regulatory framework, biodiversity, uh, private veterinary sector, nutrition relating to rangelands, which I know nothing about. But rangeland management is a really complicated field, and they need to be involved. Crop forages, banking, microcredit. Until there's a banking system and microcredit systems, people can't invest in their own stuff, right? So we're talking about financial, veterinary, ecosystem management. Um, I'm sure there's chemistry in here somewhere. There's, there's <laughs> definitely economics, right? There, this is a multidisciplinary field. And One Health is so much bigger than, oh, how do I prevent salmonella? How do I prevent brucella? How do I present, prevent Rift Valley fever? It's part of it. It matters. It's what we always talk about. And you can't leave out the zoonotic disease. But it's so much bigger than that, and you have a lot of opportunities in your career to address it in different ways. You just have to be more creative with your thinking and with your degree to do so. But you'll be well prepared when you leave here to start down that path. So, any questions? I don't think I have a question slide. Oh, my reference slide. If you want any, I can send them to you. Okay?